Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'm Judy Piper. I'm an engineering leader at C-Labs and also the host for this Tech Talk series. Cello Tech Talk is a, one of many Cello Foundation's efforts to share and spread the Cello technology knowledge with the growing Cello community. Back in January, back in April, we kicked off the first Cello Tech Talk uh, to give an introduction to Cello's full stack architecture and design at a high level. Um, at the time, I had uh, some crazy blue hair, so no longer, you can't even go to hair salon anymore. <laughs> in the subsequent talks, we delved deeper into different building blocks of a cellar full stack solution. From cellar's consensus mechanism, proof of stake, to stability protocol and price oracle, to governance protocol, uh, to num phone number privacy, cellar blockchain, SDK, Valora, and last week, a field is onboarding um, and many more. Um, and also this Tuesday, uh, Kobe Gurkun, a crypto engineering lead at, at C-Labs, uh, gave a talk, tech talk on Pluma, a ultra-like client protocol that makes syncing with the full nodes 17,000 times faster than other blockchain um, platforms. And Kobe and I also gave a live demo on how you can participate in the Pluma ceremony. By the way, all these uh, um, Cello Tech Talks are available on YouTube channel um, in cello.org. So if you miss them, um, please check them out um, on YouTube. And today's Tech Talk is the last Cello Tech Talk for this year. And I'm happy to have James Presswich joining me uh, to talk about cross-chain communication. With the sharding or roll-ups and dozen prominent new chains on the horizon, Connections between consensus systems are more important than ever. So it's, uh, I'm really excited to learn more about the cross-chain bridging and communication. So welcome, James. Hi, Judy. It's nice to be here. I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions before we get started. How did you get to uh, work on Celo and work at C-Labs? Uh, well, that's uh, an interesting question. I took kind of a roundabout path to get here. Uh, I started working in the blockchain space uh, almost seven years ago at this point. Um, I co-founded a small company back then called Storage. Um, you know, between now and then, I've had a few different jobs, worked consulting, and uh, co-founded a, you know, primarily uh, development and consulting company called Suma. Sumo worked on cross-chain solutions for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cosmos, Near, Solana, and a number of other prominent chains in the space. Um, earlier this year, Sumo was acquired by C Labs, and the Sumo team joined uh, C Labs, working on Cello full time. Uh, my role at C Labs is focusing on uh, the consensus system, hard fork changes, and cross-chain interoperability. Awesome. Are you ready to start? Please. I am definitely ready to start. All right, let's get started. Uh, once yes. we start, uh, we'd like to postpone the ask a question section to um, at the end of the presentation. So if you can post your questions to a ask a question tab that you see on your bottom of your screen. All right, take it away, James. Thanks. All right. Um, so uh, Judy gave me a brief introduction. My name is James Prestwich. Uh, I'm a protocol engineer at C-Labs working on uh, interoperability, hard forks, uh, consensus systems, etc. cetera. Um, my background here is uh, co-founding Suma. We worked really an awful lot on atomic swaps back in 2017 and then pivoted into working on more uh, SPV-based cross-chain communication after that. Um, and so the, the goals for this talk are to kind of get an intuitive understanding of these applications, like what is a bridge and why do we want it? And then dive down into how they're constructed and talk about cross-chain communication in a general sense. So go from first principles and talk about why these applications exist, uh, how they work and why they have to work that way why the uh, peculiarities of a blockchain demand that they work this way. Um, and uh, you know, 
After we talk about bridges and communication in general, I'm going to give two examples of how communication works in practice, and we'll give a little depth on the trade-off and pros and cons of each one. And uh, after that, I'll go to questions. Uh, feel free to drop any questions you have about anything along the way into chat, um, and I will address those you know, as soon as reasonably possible. Um, throughout the talk, we're going to be using standard flowchart shapes. Uh, the rounded rectangles are the start and end. The rectangles are steps in a process. The parallelograms are inputs and outputs for that process. And diamonds are decisions. Uh, for brevity, to not use up all the slide space on diamonds, uh, I've omitted some of the decision paths. So you can see this diamond only has one whisker on the way out. Uh, just assume that when you see one whisker, uh, the other path, the one that I've omitted, means everything falls apart and you do not get a bridge today and it's a massive headache for everybody. Great. Uh, so we, we want to talk about bridges, right? What is a bridge between blockchains? Uh, here, here's our problem statement. We have Bitcoin and we want to use it in dApps. Uh, Bitcoin has been going up and up and up this week. I would like to move it over to Ethereum, put it in Compound, and borrow against it and leverage my Bitcoin that way. Um, more generally, anytime we have information on one chain and we want to use it on another, we need some sort of communication channel. Uh, this means if you have a smart contract on Ethereum and you want to call a smart contract on Celo, you need communication. Uh, if you have, you know, Cosmos and you want to interact with it on Near, you need some kind of communication channel. All of these things use the same basic mechanisms. It's the application layer that's different. A bridge is a specific application of communication. We have this nice little trust boundary between the two blockchains. We want to uh, lock some Bitcoin and we want to mint WBTC or TBTC or some other representational asset uh, and use it in dApps. And going back the other way, you want to do the exact opposite thing. Pull that TBTC or WBTC out of a dApp and unlock the Bitcoin. And to do that, you need to cross this uh, boundary between chains. So the, the part that makes it a bridge is the application layer, right? Is you're minting and burning that uh, WBTC or that TBTC. And a bridge you know, mints and burns tokens to keep the supply uh, equal. So the idea is that there's one locked Bitcoin for every WBTC, and there's one locked Bitcoin for every TBTC. Uh, and you, know, you might be thinking right now, well, uh, minting tokens is easy. We've had thousands of tokens minted in the last three years, and most of them are terrible. Uh, anyone with like half a laptop can issue a new token. Um, and you'd, you'd be right about that. The thing that makes bridges really difficult isn't this you know, supply preservation uh, or minting and burning application. Uh, the thing that makes it difficult is how do you actually cross that boundary between chains? How do you go magically from you know, Bitcoin to Ethereum? Uh, it's um, the, the hard part isn't representing the Bitcoin as an ERC-20 token. It's whether that representation, whether that token is reliable, whether you can take it and go and get Bitcoin back when you want it. Uh, and we need something there that's not magic. We, we need uh, cross-chain communication. Um, and you, you can kind of see here that the minting and burning have to be connected, but the communication channels don't. In fact, uh, bridges don't use a two-way channel. You're not sending messages back and forth from Bitcoin to Ethereum. Uh, they use two one-way channels. Every cross-chain communication app application can only use one-way channels. Bridges and all of these other things are what we call dual simplex. There are no round trips. It's not like a TCP or a phone where you know, you're talking on the same connection. You actually have to have two dual, one-way, simplex connections. Uh, 
In fact, these communication channels are entirely independent of each other. The process for sending a message from Bitcoin to Ethereum is completely different from the process of sending a message the other way, from Ethereum to Bitcoin. And each of those can fail independently. Uh, and because of the way blockchains work, dual uh, duplex channels, sending messages you know, both directions on one channel is impossible. Uh, dual simplex is the best thing we can possibly do. Um, we need to figure out uh, how we can reliably make these channels and make a bunch of them going multiple directions from multiple chains. And to do that, we kind of want to get back to our goals. You know, We understand what we want to do. We want to build this bridge because we want to use Bitcoin within dApps. Right? So what are the constraints on these communication channels that we use to build bridges? And uh, I want to unpack a communication channel so we can kind of dig into that deeper and we can understand this a little better. Uh, we've established that our bridge needs two one-way channels. Uh, so how do we actually build a channel? This is what we want to happen. You know, we have something on an origin chain and we want to send that message to the destination chain. We have Bitcoin and we want to send some message that turns it into wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. Uh, we can't, even though I wish we could, we can't just send that message directly. Bitcoin doesn't know about Ethereum. Ethereum doesn't know about Bitcoin. The nodes are different. The software is different. The chain's different. Um, so we have these like two boundaries we need to cross. We need to get it out of Bitcoin, and then we need to get it into Ethereum. Okay. So Ethereum, dApps can't receive messages directly. We need to send a transaction to kick that off. So we're going to add some more steps. Uh, we would like to have Bitcoin just batch an Ethereum transaction that gets processed and sends a message to the DAP. So we'd like to lock Bitcoin, have Bitcoin make an Ethereum transaction, have Ethereum process that transaction, and then have the new wrapped Bitcoin minted. Uh, unfortunately, Bitcoin doesn't have Ethereum keys. Celo doesn't have Cosmos keys. Cosmos doesn't have Celo keys. Uh, we can't just send a transaction from one chain to another. Uh, and that means we need to add just a few more steps to our little process. We need to add some off-chain actors, someone who is going to look at Bitcoin, see that a message wants to be sent, and then decide to forward it to Ethereum and make a transaction on Ethereum. So the origin chain is going to commit the message to its own state or history, some off-chain actor, uh, a relay or a trusted bridge, sees that message and makes an Ethereum transaction and sends that transaction to Ethereum. This is the only way that cross-chain communication is possible. Uh, there is no other way to do it. Okay. So the, the reason for this is that chains are passive. They can only respond to uh, transactions. They can change their internal state, but they can never reach outside of themselves. Um, you may have noticed in the last slide, I said that the sending chain commits the message. Uh, that's all it does is it says, this is a message. Other people have to see that, send it, and make sure that it confirms on the destination chain. Communications have to be active. Really what we want is for Bitcoin to dispatch a message, to push it out there and know that it reaches its destination. Uh, because that's not possible, we need this off-chain actor ensuring it, it happens. Um, you, you may be thinking right now, well, what if that off-chain actor just doesn't do that? Uh, and 90% of the design of a communication channel is ensuring that that off-chain actor behaves correctly, ensuring that messages get where they're supposed to go and that the message is good when it gets there. The whole uh, taxonomy for these constructions, the way we think about them and sort them and organize them, is based on the trust model for the off-chain party. So uh, 
we, we have kind of this intuitive understanding of the constraints, right? We know that the we want to send a message from Bitcoin to Ethereum. Uh, Bitcoin can't send messages to Ethereum, so we have to introduce this complex off-chain party, someone running a server out there and making Ethereum transactions. Uh, so let's let's talk about the trust models for that party. And this is where we get into what makes a you know bridge good uh, or better. Um, WBTC might work, but it uses what we call a uh, trusted. Hmm. So let's let's back up a step. I forgot some of my setup here. Um, the sending chain, Bitcoin, can't make any statement at all about the off-chain actor or their behavior. It pushes this message out to its own state, and then it's done. Uh, it has no more information about that message. So if we want to be sure that the message gets to its destination, uh, we need to add one more step. We need to add a step to the destination chain to incentivize the off-chain actor to make sure the message gets there and to ensure that the message is good. Uh, we want to zoom in on this a little more and unpack it, right? So let's zoom in. Uh, this is our basic process. Uh, the majority of communication channel design is here on the destination chain. How do we authenticate a message that's incoming? Uh, if somebody, some off-chain guy, has sent me a transaction that says Bitcoin was locked, how do we know that uh, they're not lying? And how do we know that we see all of these messages that we want to see? So the, the real question here is, like, what makes a message good? If I'm a blockchain with no knowledge of the outside world and I just passively react to things, what makes a message uh, trustworthy? Um, what do I, as a passive blockchain, know that I can act on? At some point, the destination chain has to commit. It has to say, yes, this incoming message is valid, or no, it is invalid. And because this is a blockchain, we need programmatic criteria for this. We need a Solidity program that we can run that looks at a message from Bitcoin and says whether it's real or not. And this is actually a very difficult thing to write. Uh, not, not impossible, though. So uh, we have a few different ways of accomplishing this. Um, the first one is a trusted communication channel. So we want to send a message from Bitcoin to some dApp. Uh, what we'll do is we will have James sign it. And I promise I will forward all of these messages. And I will never drop any. And I will never uh, abuse my authority. And that way, the destination chain can just check if James signed the message. And if uh, I signed it, then it's good. Because we can all always trust James. Um, the, the upside to trusted models is uh, the messages are small. It can make arbitrary statements, so you can say anything about Bitcoin. Um, and it's fast and really cheap to validate. Uh, and you know we can expand this from James to James and five of his friends and turn it into a federation. Uh, WBTC, for example, is a trusted federation. Um, Liquid is a trusted federation. Uh, the, the cons here are that there's a single point of failure. And with a federation, that gets slightly better, but it's it's still not great. Um, it's prone to censorship because I'm, I'm James. I decide what I sign, and I can just choose not to uh, sign your messages. So I can censor your cross-chain messages. And the failure mode is uh, catastrophic. If I get hit by a bus, all of your money is gone forever. And if I decide to steal it, you know, I'm the authority here. No one can stop me from doing that. So we'd, we'd usually like to do better. WBTC uh, works. It works great in practice. Um, but we, we feel like there are better trade-offs in the future. And so a lot of the stuff we built at Sumo was focused on relays. The idea behind a relay is that instead of having this trusted party sitting between the two chains forwarding messages, you want to run the sender's consensus process uh, on the destination chain. So Ethereum runs the Bitcoin consensus process. Ethereum runs Bitcoin's proof of work and follows Bitcoin's headers. 
Um, so you get this local view of Bitcoin's blockchain within an Ethereum contract. Um, these are deployed in practice as part of TBTC. Uh, this is functionally equivalent to running a light client of Bitcoin within Ethereum. The general idea here, you know, is we are trying to establish what happened on Bitcoin just like a wallet would. Uh, so we can use the same tools and techniques that a wallet would to find out what's going on without syncing the entire blockchain. So we're running this very specialized light client for the sender chain inside the destination chain. Um, and the, the message flow looks kind of like this, is you get this new transaction to the relay. You're going to check if it's a header. If it's a header, then we're going to update our chain. We're going to update our light client. You want to check that it extends some known header so that it connects to the chain that you already know about. And then you check that the proof of work is valid. If it is, you can update your local view of the remote state. So you can update the Ethereum contract's image of Bitcoin, what it thinks is going on in the Bitcoin consensus process, and where it thinks the Bitcoin chain is. And you can do this for every Bitcoin header as it comes in. So you keep up to date with the Bitcoin chain. And that means that you have a pretty darn good, reliable view of whether a Bitcoin transaction has been confirmed because you can see it under the headers. And so uh, to do that, you know, you get this incoming transaction. If it's not a header, it's a trend, then it is a Bitcoin transaction. And so we want to check that it's in our view of the remote state. And in Bitcoin, this means checking a Merkle proof that it's inside a header we already know about. So you check that this transaction is confirmed by six Bitcoin headers. And you can do that all in an Ethereum smart contract. So if the transaction is confirmed by six Bitcoin headers, we know that it's trustworthy. We know that it's actionable, uh, just like a Bitcoin wallet does. Uh, and then we can check if it contains some message we care about, if it contains like some Bitcoin or uh, some data from the Bitcoin chain. And we can dispatch that to the right DAP. So there's really two processes going on here. Uh, there's the header chain following, is you keep this light client up to date. And then there's the actual messaging, right? Uh, you check a transaction to see if it's inside these headers, if it has Bitcoin confirmations. And if it does, you can dispatch that message to the DAP. Um, you being the relay, the destination chain in this case. Uh, this means that there's a significant amount of overhead. You have to make a bunch of extra transactions to keep the relay up to date. You're going to be spending money updating this light client, even if there are no messages being sent. So that's kind of a trade-off compared to uh, proof of authority. Um, and you know, in terms of trade-offs, there's additional complexity for proof of stake protocols. Uh, this is very similar. The bottom side of the graph is exactly the same as the proof of work. All of the transaction processing and checking is just the same. You want to see if it's confirmed based on your view of the the other chain's uh, the other chain, the other chain state and header and consensus process. Um, updating the view is uh, significantly more complex. This happens because proof of work is what we call objective. You can look at a hash and know immediately how hard it was to create and how much electricity and ASICs went into producing the Bitcoin proof of work header. Um, this is not the case with proof of stake. Proof of stake relies on knowing the balances of each of the validators. And you can only know the balances if you know the state of the chain. But to learn the state of the chain, you have to check the validator signatures, which means you need to know their balances, which means you need to know the state of the chain. So you get this like circular dependency. Uh, and what this means is you can only check a proof of stake header if you have the previous state. Uh, you have to keep your relay up to date or it will break. So for proof of stake, we introduce these new parts of the chart. 
uh, we have to have a trusted setup. We need to tell the relay about the current proof of state balances. Who's the validator? What are their balances? Whose signatures do we need? What are their public keys? How do we check those signatures? Um, and we need to keep that relay up to date. Uh, each proof of stake process has what we call an epoch, a time period where the validators don't change or uh, change in a small amount that doesn't matter. Uh, and so every epoch, we need to update our relay. Uh, this is what we call a synchrony assumption. Uh, synchrony is about timing. We need to update for Celo once a day. Uh, for other uh, protocols, it's on the period of two to three weeks. And if we don't do that, then we get back to this kind of, well, what's the balances? Who's the validators problem? Uh, so once we've set up the proof of stake relay, we need to keep it up to date every day on a regular basis. And we need to constantly be updating our local view of the signer set. And then we update our local view of the remote state. If we ever miss one of these epochs, then the proof of stake relay is broken. It no longer has the security it used to uh, because we have gotten off and we no longer know what the balances of the validators are. And that means that if we miss this synchrony assumption, we have to halt the relay, it's broken, and we need to do a trusted setup to reboot it. And so uh, proof of stake relays are a little bit more operationally complex. Um, and in addition, uh, the overhead for checking signatures is generally much, much higher than the overhead for checking proof of work. Uh, Bitcoin SHA-2 in EVM costs something like 140 gas uh, twice. So in the neighborhood of 300 gas to check a header, where Ethereum's uh, proof of work costs millions of gas and uh, proof of stake would tend to cost tens of millions of gas. Uh, we have a bunch of tricks to make that cheaper, but it still is a pretty significant overhead. Um, anyway, getting, getting back to our communication channel, we have this, uh, you know, we have this diagram of our channel. The sending chain commits some message, some off-chain actor sees it. With a relay, that off-chain actor can be anyone. Anyone can look and get the latest headers from Celo or from Bitcoin and send them on to the other chain. Uh, the um, destination chain uses the relay to validate these messages. It checks its view of the origin chain and sees if the messages are within that view. And then it dispatches them to the DAP. The pros and cons here are, uh, you know, the relay is just as good as the origin chain's consensus set. Uh, if the Bitcoin miners are honest, the relay will be honest too. Uh, if the Celo validators are honest, the Celo relay will be honest too. Um, and anyone can participate in forwarding headers because the headers are public info, and there's no permissioning system, anyone can uh, forward those on. The downside is that there's a lot of overhead. There's overhead messages. You have to keep this relay up to date. Um, and there's a trusted setup for the relay. In uh, proof of work, this means inserting some block that you build off of. In proof of stake, this means inserting some validator set. And uh, for proof of stake, that relay may need to be redone many times. So uh, while we're here, a brief note about sharding. Um, it gets brought up a lot. And uh, you may be wondering how to fit it into this kind of mental model we've been building of cross-chain communication. Uh, sharding is mandatory relays. In this case, the off-chain actor is the consensus set of each chain. And uh, the relay is part of the consensus. So when we're talking about ETH2 sharding, the beacon chain is relaying each shard chain. And each shard chain is relaying the beacon chain. They're both following along with each other. And the other thing that makes it sharding is that the failures are shared. Uh, this sounds like a bad thing, but is actually a, a really good feature. It means that if one of the shards does something uh, irresponsible and breaks safety, 
uh, allows double spends, uh, steals money from contracts and gives it to the validators, etc. That the whole system will become aware of that and will uh, prevent it from happening. Uh, with a relay in a smart contract, if the origin chain is malicious, if they allow double spends or something, the relay never learns of that and can break and cause bad results. So in this case, shared failures is good because it prevents users from being harmed. Um, so sharding, you know, it's just relaying. You're following along with the other chain's consensus process, uh, and you are failing if it fails, um, which is really nice, and it's why a bunch of people are uh, interested in building it. And you might have also heard of atomic swaps. Uh, so uh, a lot of people ask me about these, and I did a lot of work on them back in 2014. And you know, if you're if you're thinking right now, uh, what about atomic swaps? My answer is always going to be, well, what about them? They don't solve any problems. You can't use them to build a bridge. Uh, you can't use them to communicate, practically speaking. They're sort of this kind of synchronization primitive, but they don't even work very well for that. Uh, synchronization with a multi-hour delay is not really great for anybody. Uh, they might make more sense on layer two, but we haven't really seen that yet. Um, anyway, this is uh, about the end of my prepared material. I'm going to put up a, a chart of Celo, Cosmos, and ETH2. These are some of the technical considerations for building relays between these chains. Uh, you have to be able to validate the remote consensus, which means you need to validate the signatures for that cons for that proof of stake consensus. Uh, based on this chart, it should be relatively straightforward to bridge Cosmos and Celo and uh, Celo and ETH2 uh, in Cosmos and Celo two directions, two channels. Um, but Celo and ETH2 and Cosmos and ETH2, because ETH2 does not support any signature schemes or, in fact, smart contracts at all yet, this is still a long way off. Um, I'm going to start going through the questions in chat, so please feel free to drop anything else there. Before we go into the Q&A, James, if you could move on to the next slide. slide. Oop, there we go. This one. Yeah, that one. So this Tech Talk is the last of the uh, um, this year's Cello Tech Talk series. So New Year, in the New Year 2021, uh, we're going to pick up the building your first DevOps um, Cello Tech Talk that Barbara, uh, who is a DevOps lead, in, uh, lead, and she gave already overview of how you can start on the building a, your first steps on Cello and also walked you through um, how to set up your development environment and what have you. In the last uh, workshop, she also walked you through um, how to build using Solidity. But the next session that we're gonna start kick off in the new year, uh, I think Barbara has in mind for um, using mobile application. So it'll be exciting workshop. So come and join the workshop in the new year. Back to you, James. And we have uh, two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So the uh, questions mostly seem to be about um, the actual costs of running these relays. Uh, the only one of these running practically is the Bitcoin relay that's part of TBTC. Um, and so I wrote all of that myself. Uh, the costs ended up being um, pretty reasonable uh, because it was Bitcoin. Um, so we mentioned briefly that Bitcoin's proof of work is very cheap. Bitcoin also produces headers only every 10 minutes. Uh, so you only get 144 headers per day. Um, the cost per header was in the low to mid tens of thousands of gas. And then the cost to validate a transaction was relatively high uh, and uh, scales linearly with the transaction size. Uh, so I want to say that uh, a transaction of uh, reasonable size plus six headers cost um, less than 750,000 gas. 
Uh, it's been a long time since I benchmarked that, and the gas costs have changed since then and will change again in the next Ethereum hard fork. Uh, it, we spent a lot of time optimizing the relay to avoid um, reading state, which is the really expensive part of an Ethereum transaction. Uh, and given that that expense is going to keep going up over time, uh, I think it's worth optimizing. Um, the issue here is that proof of stake systems both have a much higher cost to validate a header and they produce headers at a much faster rate. Uh, the other half of that coin though is that proof of stake systems usually support um, uh, uh, skipping blocks. So having your relay be able to accept blocks from the middle of an epoch if they're signed by the validator set. So where a proof of work relay, you need to send every block as soon as it happens all the time. For a proof of stake relay, you only need to send uh, one epoch block, and then you need to send a block every time there is a message. Um, so uh, as you need to send a block every time there's a message, which means that if people aren't using your relay much, it gets very cheap. If there's only one message per day, you only need to send two headers that day. Uh, and so you can kind of amortize that very high per header cost. Um, the bulk of those costs uh, for a proof of stake relay is the signature checking. Um, for ed signatures, it costs, um, well, currently each ed signature is uh, close to a million gas in EVM. We're doing the donut hard fork to bring that down to 1,500 gas, which is going to make it very practical to do edge signatures. Um, the BLS signatures are still going to be in the tens of thousands of gas after the hard fork. Right now, they're just impractically uh, expensive, like 100 million or so. Uh, so you need to spend this, you know, uh, thousands of gas per signature and then for non-aggregatable signatures, you need to validate dozens of signatures. Uh, so for a Cosmos bridge, you need to actually check 67 signatures most of the time. And so 67 times 1,500 is uh, close to 100,000 all, it, all by itself, right? Um, so the, the primary costs of a POS relay are going to be checking all those signatures uh, which currently is impossible in EVM, and after the hard fork will still be a significant per header uh, cost. Uh, the next question is, why does the trusted relay setup uh, need to happen more than once? Can this not be done in a trustless manner by uploading all the missing epoch headers from the current stale head? So the issue there is uh, proof of stake uh, you want to trust the current validator set only. Um, if you allow uh, updating past epochs from the stale head, what you're doing is you are adding a new trust assumption. You are trusting that every validator from those stale epochs that have already elapsed isn't uh, creating a fake history. Um, so say that we are at... Uh, epoch 500 on the main chain, and the relay is at 400. Uh, what you're doing if you allow updating from the stale head 400 is you're trusting that out of the 100 epochs, no validator set has conspired to lie to the relay. And any of those 100 validator sets could do that without penalty in the Celo ecosystem. Uh, so we, we really... Um, we really don't want to be doing that. Uh, we don't want to be trusting that all past validator sets are honest. Um, you can allow past epochs if at least two thirds of the validators are current. Uh, no, you, you can't because uh, those validators would not be punished for equivocation in past epochs. The security here is coming from the uh, knowledge that the validators are punished for signing two different blocks at the same height which is no longer true once that epoch is closed out. Uh, so you, uh, this class of attack is usually called a long-range attack. Um, 
some far past validator set can build an alternate chain without penalty. And they can do it in such a way that, uh, you know, they can build any number of these alternate histories very cheaply. They just need to like build and sign all the blocks. So for any proof of stake like client to remain secure, it needs to follow along epoch by epoch. Um, for, for Cello, though, we, we'd really rather use Plumo for this. Um, some of the ultralight client things can apply pretty directly. There is a, a trade-off with Plumo is that it's uh, higher constant costs for lower scaling costs. Um, so for keeping a relay up to date, you'll usually want to go epoch by epoch, but sometimes you could use Plumo to catch up uh, distances. Um, it's interesting that uh, for Cello, you can slash for quite a bit of history. I got to look into that a little more. Um, in you know Cosmos, for example, uh, they don't have defined epochs. So you need to base your light client on what is the amount of time it takes one third of the validator set to unbond, uh, which is a few weeks, if I recall correctly. Um, Ethereum is pretty similar. Uh, have I thought about how to incentivize different actors in the trustless bridge, like relayers, that keep the cross-chain light client up to date, and provers that help bridge users with transaction inclusion proofs? Um, yeah, so we did a significant amount of this work at Suma, and uh, it should all be open source out on GitHub. Uh, we uh, focused on making the experience of using these very easy for smart contract devs. Um, we kind of figured that the main friction here for users and devs is watching Bitcoin, building these proofs, and submitting them on time. Uh, this requires off-chain infrastructure that needs to run all the time. And so the incentive model that we came up with is that the smart contracts would pay for a proof. Uh, so some other party would be responsible for watching Bitcoin, producing those proofs, and submitting them to the relay. And whenever they did so, they would get paid. Uh, we never really implemented this, um, but we're kind of optimistic about the idea for future versions of TBTC, among other things. Um, uh, what we have is all of the code for this. Uh, what we don't have is the production system and people interested in using it. It you know, kind of turns out that uh, cross-chain communication in general uh, has... Cross-chaining communication in general is very difficult for users and for developers to reason about. And so where we see this going in practice is a very small number of parties actually participating in this directly. Uh, with TBTC, you know, there are more holders of TBTC than there are people minting and burning it by a wide margin. Uh, minting and burning the actual cross-chain communication part is a specialized job that people are doing. Uh, and so I think as long as there is a payment for that specialization, the incentive schemes, the incentives will work out. All right. Um, we don't have any more questions on the Ask a Question tab. Do folks have any other questions for James? I think we are ending the last cell attack time quite early today. It's great. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks James again for oh, celebrating you. the last cell attack time. Yay for this year. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.